Hello, I'm Dan Loy, Extension Beef Specialist from Iowa State University and Director of the Iowa Beef Center. What I plan to do this today is spend a few minutes with you talking about uh, some of the issues that uh, you may be dealing with this year as you look at uh, protein supplementation for your beef cattle. Um, we've become accustomed to uh, feeding high levels of corn co-products and distiller's grains and in many cases we've overfed protein in the last few years. and uh, the current volatility in feed prices has set the stage for some d new decisions that uh, many producers may not have been accustomed to at least in the last four or five years. So just as a general overview of the topics that uh, we'll cover in the next few minutes is just a little bit of background on protein and distillers grains and where we're at currently. Uh, a review of how we might go about looking at the cost of protein and I want to talk about metabolizable protein because that's one way to evaluate different protein sources in a useful way to determine whether or not the lowest cost protein sources are useful for a particular feeding program or uh, situation. Uh, spend just a few minutes talking about the brands program or other programs like brands that account for the degradable protein or the DIP and we'll uh, elaborate on that a little bit further as we go through this. And then finally talk about some potential of uh, urea toxicity, some general thumb rules and how we might go about avoiding those issues if we're looking at urea as a low co cost source. Of well, for most of the last five years or so, the periods of 2007 to two, 2000 and through, well, through this year, corn co-products have, have been cheaper than corn. And in, in many cases they may be again this year. And uh, when that happens, we uh, have an economic incentive to feed just as much as we possibly can. And so they become an energy source. And when we do that, we have an incentive to overfeed protein. So the need to balance many diets for protein really hasn't existed in the last five years because we're always feeding more than we really need. But as protein, or as, I'm sorry, as prices for distiller's grains have increased over the past months, and at times become more expensive than corn, uh, distiller's grains now becomes a protein source and that's how... So how do we compare value and prices of different sources of protein? On well, this chart we uh, have compared uh, several common feedstuffs, distiller's grains, modified distiller's grains, soybean meal, corn grain, urea, and alfalfa. And these are prices that I uh, found in early October, average statewide prices. And so in the columns we have uh, listed here the percent protein, the price either per ton or per bushel in the case of corn, and then we calculated the cost per unit of dry matter and the cost per unit of crude protein. So this is really the first step that you might take in evaluating sources of protein. And we see that uh, dried distiller's grains, modified distiller's grains, uh, and alfalfa all have very similar cost per unit of crude protein, 45 to 50 cents uh, per pound of crude protein in the ration. At um, soybean meal was a little higher at 57 cents per pound of crude protein, but there have been times this past summer where uh, soybean meal, uh, particularly locally, uh, was a lower, uh, was a cheaper source of protein than distiller's grains or other corn coke products that may have been, may have been available. Notice that urea, priced at $700 per ton because it is, uh, uh, you know, it is a non-protein nitrogen source, is the lowest cost source of crude protein in this example at 12.4 cents. So that, if, if that is the case, the, and we are looking at evaluating sources of protein, so now urea, uh, we have an incentive to feed as much urea as we can utilize in a particular diet. So the question becomes, how do we know how much urea can be utilized? Well, to do that, the next couple of slides um, are kind of an overview into how ruminants, cattle in particular, digest different sources of protein and how they, we might determine if they utilize, uh, uh, can utilize NPN or uh, urea. So there's several acronyms that you may hear thrown about by the nutritionist, and let me just go through those very quickly. And it can be, become very confusing. First of all, you know, an animal consumes feed, the, the, the source of the feed we talk about as crude protein. That's the total amount of protein that the animal ingests. 
You may hear your nutritionist talking about the DIP, or degradable intake protein. That's the protein that's immediately degraded in the rumen to ammonia. And uh, we'll describe how that fits into protein systems in a little bit later. But d the, the proportion of DIP in feedstuffs is an important measure of whether or not urea can be used. UIP, on the other hand, is the undegraded intake protein. You may have heard uh, talk about bypass protein. UIP is the bypass protein. That protein gets the, the amino acids are not degraded. They're passed on through the rumen, absorbed by the animal in their small intestine as amino acids. Now, ruminants have the unique ability of utilizing or potentially utilizing NPN or non-protein nitrogen. This includes ammonia. It includes urea. So non-protein nitrogen may be able to be utilized because the bacteria or microbial crude protein, MCP, can, can manufacture their own protein. In other words, they grow and develop, take the non-protein nitrogen along with some energy and form microbial crude protein, which can be absorbed um, by the animal as protein as well. So basically, if we can boil it down to a couple basic principles, Bacteria in the rumen can make protein. They utilize non-protein nitrogen, but they also require energy. Um, they require, or, or they only require amino acids for, or the animal only requires amino acids for the needs that the bacteria can't manufacture. Okay, and so there's two requirements: that for the animal and that for the bacteria. And so if we look at how a protein system, or how we can evaluate whether uh, different sources of protein might be useful. Let's look at this particular schematic because this is is really how we we do it. A crude protein that enters the rumen. Now, immediately when the feed enters the rumen, some of that protein is going to be degraded to ammonia. That's the DIP, degradable intake protein. Now, if this is urea, 100% of it will be almost immediately degraded to ammonia. Now, with natural feeds like soybean meal, even there, a large proportion is degraded to, um, to uh, ammonia, or is DIP. Soybean meal is about 75% DIP, which means 25% is bypassed or is part of the UIP, undegraded intake protein, which goes to the small intestine, is metabolized, and contributes to the MP, or metabolizable protein. So, what happens to the DIP? Well. It can be used by the microbial crude protein, or the bacteria, to form microbial crude protein. In other words, they grow and multiply, and, and the protein becomes part of their bodies, and the animal actually uh, digests the bacteria themselves. But only if there's enough energy in the ration, either through feed intake or energy density, for, to, for those animals to utilize that. So there's two parts of this protein system, the DIP and UIP, and then the energy that's available to utilize that. Okay, so um, as you work with your nutritionist, you should, and, and if they're using the metabolizable protein system, each feedstuff has a DIP value, or so we know the amount of degradable intake protein from your natural feedstuffs. What about commercial feeds? Well, by law, um, feed manufacturers are required to put on their feed tag the amount of non-protein nitrogen or urea that is used in the manufacture that feeds the crude protein in this um, feed uh, sup the supplement was 36 percent and that 11.2 percent was from non-protein nitrogen or urea on this slide but this is how in the brands program beef ration and nutrition decision software and I, I should mention that if you're nutri there are other software programs that use metabolizable protein. So any software that is using the National Research Council uh, protein system for beef cattle will be able to evaluate in this way. But what we look at, if you get a printout with of the Brands program, is we look in the red circle you see the DIP, degraded intake protein, ratio. And that tells us in this ration that if this number is less than 100 percent, then we can utilize some urea or NPN in this ration up to about 100 percent. So there would be uh, the available or the, the possibility of adding some urea in this particular ration. If you look up here on the line that says metabolizable protein requirement, 
147% for a mature cow. We're overfeeding protein by almost 50%, so we really don't need to add protein to this ration. But if we did need protein, we could add a small amount of urea or NPN. Beyond that, after it reaches 100, then we would need to feed a natural source to meet the requirements of these animals. Now, in cases where energy is limited, um, there are possibilities, especially if we overfeed urea, that we can create toxicity. And because of that, there have been thumb rules developed through the years to, to aid in, what the, in evaluating what the maximum levels that can, of, of urea that can be fed. And so here are those thumb rules. Maximum of one-third of the ration nitrogen from NPN. Urea should be no more than 10 to 15 percent of a protein supplement. NPN should be no more than 1 percent of the diet or 3 percent of the concentrate and should contain no more than 5 percent of a supplement used with low quality forages. Now if you're use, evaluating using the metabolizable protein system you may periodically be able to feed higher levels than these but you need to evaluate it on that basis. So just to wrap up some final thoughts. We need to evaluate the energy uh, cost of, of the rations first. You know, if distiller's grains or corn co-products are the lowest energy source, in all likelihood y y the protein requirements are already met. But in cases where we're feeding them as protein sources, then we need to look at what our alternatives are. So compare your protein sources on the basis of crude protein, but then make sure that you use metabolizable protein to balance for those if you want to inc include NPN, especially with low quality forages or in growing rations where uh, the intake of energy may be limited to some extent. So thank you. Your uh, beef specialist will, uh, will help you with questions and, uh, and guide you through the process uh, if you do have additional questions.